lunchtime webinars to help people spot wildlife through May in Devon. So the first one we had was on uh, birds that you can find in Devon and they were around some of the predatory birds that we have uh, on doves and on finches. The second one was on bats and then this one we're doing on rock pulling. And last year we did the same thing in May. We had some on trees, wildflowers and different species of birds. So when we have um, finished today and we've put this up on YouTube, we will send you the link so you can find those as well. Um, just to also let you know, we are going to be recording today. So um, if you don't want your camera on, it, it probably won't record you, but you can turn your camera off if that's something you don't want as well. And then it will take me about a week to do the captions and we'll put it on YouTube and send the recording to everybody. Um, so before we get started, I just want to introduce to you Coral Smith, who is the Marine Awareness and Engagement Officer at Wembry. And Coral, how long have you been the officer at Wembry for? Uh, so I've been here, uh, I think this is my ninth season here. So 2014 was when I joined Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, yeah, I've been loving it ever since. So if you do go down to Wembry, you will probably will see Coral running rock pooling, but it's not just rock pooling. They do um, safaris, snorkel safaris and nighttime rock pooling, but that you're also involved in other kind of awareness and recording of species. So things a bit further up to sea with cetaceans as well. So there's lots of things going on at Wembry and in Devon, it is the only marine station that we have. So it's a really special place. And um, growing up in Devon, it was the place to go rock pulling. Whenever you turn over a rock, you'll always find something like a cushion star or um, a lump fish. And recently, we, I'm looking after my nephew today and we took him. And the first thing he did was turn over a rock and find a cushion star. And it was the most exciting thing. So hopefully today um, you'll be able to pick up some hints and tips of what you can find not just in Wembry, but around the coast of Devon. North Devon's also got some fantastic places. And I was in Dartmouth the other day and found lots of sea slugs. So there's lots that you can find around the coast. Um, and then if you do have any questions, we'll take them at the end. So please just pop them in the chat and we'll pick them up at the end for you. But apart from that, over to you, Coral. Thank you very much, Kay. And um, thank you everyone for joining us on this very hot, sunny day. Um, hopefully you've been outside, you're going outside afterwards, and uh, hopefully my little talk today can inspire you to go rock pooling this week while the, the weather and the tides are lovely. Um, so when Kate and Bella asked me to do this talk in a very short amount of time, uh, it's very difficult trying to select um, what to talk about because everything's so amazing in our rock pools in Devon. Um, so I'm just going to take you on a whistle stop tour of some of the common things that we can find when we rock pool in Devon and perhaps some of the the harder to find things, but really interesting, all the weird and wonderful creatures that we get in our rock pools. OK. So um, as Kate said, I'm the Marine Awareness uh, and Engagement Officer for Devon Wildlife Trust, and I'm based here at Wembry Marine Centre. So Wembry Beach is just outside Plymouth. Um, it's an amazing place. It's got all the environmental designations you could think of. Uh, the centre itself was opened in 1994. And it's managed by by us, by DWT, on behalf of a partnership, which includes the Devon County Council, a South Hams District Council, the National Trust, who, who own the land and the beach here, um, and more recently, the Marine Institute at the University of Plymouth. Uh, we also have support from South Devon AOMB and the Wembury uh, Marine Advisory Group, who set up a voluntary marine conservation area here in 1981. So Wembury was one of the first VMCAs in the country, which um, were sort of community led initiatives rather than legal designations, recognising the sheer importance of the marine environment that we have here, particularly the intertidal um, marine wildlife that we get on the rocky shore. So Wembry is one of the most heavily sort of researched and studied sites in the, in the country. The very first underwater dive took place here. So even before scuba was invented, um, a chap went down in a tube just around the corner from here. Um, anyway, I won't go on for too long about all of that, but everything that we do here, um, lots of public engagement, lots of schools education, as well as managing the visitor centre um, is possible thanks to our amazing team of volunteers and our seasonal assistants who join us each year. So they help us to achieve 
everything that we want to as the Wildlife Trust. So when we think about the marine environment, uh, when we look out to sea, a lot of the time, this is what we see. Sometimes we'll see some boats on it. If we're in South Devon, probably some Navy ships and fishing boats. Um, we don't always see what's underneath it. And that's that's why it can be really tricky to protect the marine environment, because most of the time we can't see it. And over half of Devon's wildlife lives in the sea, which I just find is a, a fascinating fact. Um, and a lot of people just, just wouldn't think about more about what what we find on Dartmoor and Exmoor than we do under the water but our job as the Wildlife Trust is to try and change that and to try and protect what we've got. One of the best ways of doing that, one of the best ways of inspiring um, interest and love for the marine environment is that very first rock pool safari that you go on as a child. So I can still remember going rock pooling with my dad at Lyme Regis in Dorset when I was young um, and it will stay with me forever and that you know I like to think that's what got me where I am today as well as my lovely name choice from my mum. So we can't talk about rock pooling without first thinking about seaweed. So I think seaweed's really overlooked when we think about rock pooling in the marine environment but actually it's absolutely fascinating and if you think about the, all of the amazing animals that we get in the water, just imagine how they would look in the rock pools if it wasn't for the seaweed. The seaweed really does bring everything to life. The colour is just incredible. Uh, we have over 100 different species of seaweed in Devon um, and it's usually characterised or classified into a brown, a red or a green. And within those three colours are lots of different types, lots of different shapes and sizes. And most of them, especially the red ones, you have to have a microscope to um, identify. But some, some ones that I really like, some special ones, and that create a really nice connection to people when we take them rock pooling, is um, this one. This is called Irish moss or carrageenan. You can't see it in the photo here, but when the light shines on it, it's got this amazing blue iridescence um, that, that it is just able to do when the light shines on it but this is the species that's used in loads of food products so it's used in our milkshakes our ice creams our toothpaste um, when I go into schools and tell the kids about that they absolutely just can't believe it and they say they're never going to eat ice cream again um, so it's it's creating those links between you know how humans use the marine environment and why we need it but just on its own is an absolutely beautiful seaweed this is my favourite species of seaweed. This is a rainbow rack. Again, you can see when the light shines on it, look at this incredible turquoise colour. When you're, if you're snorkelling and you see it under the water, it just looks sort of brown and bushy. But from above the water, or if, the, if you get the light on the right angle, it's got this incredible bluey green turquoise iridescence in it, and it's amazing. And this is one species that's becoming a lot more rare now. Used to be really common. We do get some here at Wembury and I'm sure um, lots of other places around the south coast and some on the north coast, um, but but not so common. So you wouldn't find this all the time, whereas the Irish moss um, is, is really common. You should be able to find that on most shores that you go to around Devon. So moving on to some of the animals that eat the seaweeds, the, the humble limpet is, again, an often overlooked species on the rocky shore. Um, again, when we ask children what they think they are, they just think they're shells. Um, so you have to sort of explain, well, lots of animals have shells, but what's this one in particular? This is a, an amazing sea snail, actually, and they're really important ecosystem engineers on the rocky shore. If it wasn't for the limpets and the other sea snails, the, the, rock, the rocks would just be covered in seaweed and that wouldn't allow other things to grow. It would just be overgrown, basically. So really important grazers. And another fascinating thing about limpets, which I didn't realise or didn't know about because science, it's only been in the last six years or so that scientists realise this, is that on their radula, which is their revolving tongue that they use to scrape the tiny bits of algae on the rocks, they've got the, these teeth on that radula, on that tongue, and their teeth are made of the, sharp, the strongest natural substance on the planet. OK, so it's stronger than a spider's silk, stronger than muscles, um, the byssus threads that muscles have. And that's just amazing for an for a animal that people just step all over, um, you know, the strongest teeth on the on the planet. I love the common limpet. Now they have these really important home scars that they have to get back to when the tide goes out and they grind their shell down really tightly onto the rocks to keep water inside their shells to keep them alive until the tide comes back in again. So we always leave limpets alone when we go rock pooling. 
we don't want to pull them off that home scar. They lose that connection to the rock. They might lose the water that's inside their bodies um, and they probably wouldn't survive. So we always leave the limpets alone when we go rock pooling. Another animal that we leave alone are these guys, these little red blobs of jelly. This is what they look like when they're out of the water. When they're under the water, they look like these beautiful flowers, but they are, of course, animals. These ones here are the beadlet anemones, named after these beautiful blue beads that they have under their tentacles. Relatives of jellyfish, so they do rely on their stinging cells in their tentacles to catch their food, to bring it in and eat it. And so we don't really want to touch them in case we might be allergic to them. We might be really sensitive, just have sensitive skin. But basically, we don't want to hurt them. We don't want them to waste a lot of energy thinking that our fingers are their food. So we tend to leave the limpets alone as well. Now, when we go rock pooling at Wembury, we have our big five that we look for. So we have our big five rock pool safari animals, just like you have in Africa. We've got our, our own rock pool versions and the shore crab is um, one of those. So this is probably the most common crab that we would get in Devon, sometimes called the green shore crab. Um, and as you can see here, they can have this dark green shell, but they can also have um, lots of different colours. So when they're babies, when they're really small, they can be a pale pinky colour. Um, gradually, as they grow, they molt their shells and they go darker over time. So they go to a sort of darky green colour and then um, end up brown. So these, these are very common, but actually there's another species um, called the furrowed crab, which I don't have a picture of here, but they're becoming much more common now um, due to warming waters. But another common species are our common prawns, um, identified by these stripy, um, colourful legs, which look a bit like football socks. So they're very well camouflaged in the water. Look out for these. Best thing to do if you want to try and catch a prawn is to put your bucket behind it and your hand in front of it and try and get it to go backwards into the tub because they like to dart off backwards whenever they feel threatened. So you have to just be really um, slow and steady. Now, hermit crabs. Here at Wembury, we get two types now. Well, we, we always used to get two types, the common hermit crab and the St. Piran's hermit crab. Um, if you live in Devon, then people like you to call them the Mediterranean hermit crab. Um, but they were here in Devon's waters. And then it's thought certainly here at Wembury, they disappeared in the 1980s and various theories were put forward, but no one really knew why. But then about eight years ago, one was found again in Cornwall, hence the name St. Piran's, um, which I think uh, was a spring watch public vote for the name. Um, we so very soon after started finding them at Wembury and now they're really, really common. So the way to tell the difference between the common hermit crab and the St. Piran's is that the St. Piran's have these really bright red antennae. They've got um, stripy bright red lines on their legs and their eyes are on eye stalks and they're black and white. So they're really vivid compared to the, the common hermit crab, which is just a little bit. Um, it's just sort of a brown and, and beige, not quite as striking. So do look out for the St. Piran's because people are really interested to know um, where they're occurring now. And they're, they're popping up all over the south coast in particular. I'm not too sure about the North Devon coast. So if anyone knows if they're up there, um, do put it in the chat. And moving on to our most common rock pool fish, we've got the common blenny or the shanny. Lots of different types of blennies, but if you lift up a rock and something darts out, looks quite dark, it's probably one of these guys. So they've got this mottled sort of colour. You can see here how well it's blended in with the, the limpets and the barnacles and the rocks behind it. They can actually sort of change the colour of their skin um, depending on their background. So really, you know, amazing little fish. So you find them in the rock pools and also uh, when the tide's out, look in crevices of the rocks so they can actually as long as they stay moist and dark then they just stay in these holes until the the tide comes back in again so they're very territorial now i can't do a talk about rock pooling and wembury without mentioning its most famous resident which is the tom pot blenny um, if you haven't heard paul naylor talk uh, before about these guys then you really need to um, or have a look at his book which is absolutely amazing. Paul can um, identify up to about I think it's 26 individual blennies 
um, by looking at these face markings on their cheeks. So you can see the difference between the Tompot and the Shani. If we just go back to that really quickly, the Shani's got nothing on its head, whereas the Tompot Blenny's got these two sort of head tentacles or crowns, which make it really distinctive. And then you've also got the Montague's Blenny, which just has one head tentacle. But fascinating little fish. Tompot Blennies you tend to find really far down the shore, more likely to find them snorkeling rather than rock pooling, whereas the Shani you'll find um, almost all over the place. So Kate mentioned the Cushion Star. Um, we're so lucky in Devon that we've got about 13 species of starfish. Now, this is probably one of the most common ones. It certainly is here at Wembury. If you're on a sandy beach, then um, you're probably more likely to find the common starfish, which is the same sort of orange colour, but it's a lot bigger, whereas cushion stars only get to about the size of a 50 pence piece. So they're very small and you'll find them on the underside of rocks. So they use their tube feet, which are like little suckers to stick to the underside of rocks. So you have to lift the rock up, have a really good look underneath um, and you might find a cushion star or two hanging in there. Um, so we've seen a shore crab already. This is one of the big guys. These guys can grow really big. They're called the edible crab, but also affectionately known as the pasty crab. because Their shell looks like a pasty or the pie crab or the brown crab. So these have four names, four common names. Um, and as the name suggests, it's it's the species that um, the fishing industry catches. It's the commercial species. And we've certainly noticed a decline in these here at Wembury. Um, it could be linked to overfishing. It could be linked to competition with other crabs. I mentioned the furrow crab earlier, um, but there's definitely work being done on, on sort of what's going on with the edible crab um, in Devon. And then the big guns, big guns of the crab world uh, are the spiny spider crabs. So these are these are really common at the moment in May. They come in on mass to molt. So they, they shed their shells and they mate and then they go off um, to deeper water. So uh, places like Babacum, around the sort of Torquay area, they've been filmed in their thousands where they have these huge, it's a bit like Pirates of the Caribbean where they're all walking under the water. Um, these these mass aggregations of them, which I've never seen personally, but the put the images and and films from Paul are absolutely amazing. But spider crabs again, you can find around the rocky shores. So again, on a really good low tide, you head out as far as you can um, and have a look for these guys. Good luck finding them though, because this is how they normally look. They camouflage their shells in loads of different types of seaweed. So they use their claws, their pincers, to snip up different bits of seaweed and they actually sort of wedge them into their spines on the back of their shell to make them camouflage like this. So, I mean, this was a very heavily camouflaged one. You can see it's even got an invasive species of seaweed on there. Um, so, I mean, that must have been really weighing this little spider crab down. But you've got to look out for the orange legs that are moving in the water. And um, rock pooling really is a quite a mindful activity. It can be really relaxing, not, not when we take 30 year one children out, but if you get a really nice day like today and you find a quiet place, just sit and watch and you'll definitely find more than sort of, you know, rummaging around loads of different rock pools. Um, if you take your time, you're much more likely to see things. This would be an absolute highlight to see on a rock pool safari. Again, probably more common snorkeling, but we have found these rock pooling before. We certainly get these at Wembury um, around the coast towards Plymouth um, and further east. So these are the biggest starfish we get in the UK, the spiny star. They can grow up to 70 centimetres. The ones at the aquarium in Plymouth are absolutely massive, but we, we find them here up to sort of 20 to 30 centimetres. Um, again, you can see why they get their name from these spines. They've got these purple eye spots on the end of each arm which allow them to see sort of shadows um, above them. So they're, they're one of the predators of the rock pools. So they would eat the other starfish, the cushion stars. They'll try and eat mussels and limpets. Um, they, you know, we think of starfish as not moving very fast, not doing a lot, but actually they're really powerful predators. OK, so just a couple of the, um, I suppose, more unusual things that I enjoy finding when I go rock pooling. Obviously, I go rock pooling a lot, so it's always really nice to see things that you just, you know, when you your first experience of rock pooling, or if you don't know much about marine life and you come across these, which are light bulb sea squirts, 
and then someone tells you that they're one of our closest relatives um, is, is quite mind boggling. And that's what I love about the sea is that it's so still so alien. There's so many weird and wonderful things out there. So it always keeps me interested. Um, so these are light bulb sea squirts. They're solitary sea squirts. Um, and by sea squirts, another name for them is tunicates. Um, but when they're larvae, they actually have the makings of a, a notochord or a spine. So that's why um, they're in the same phylum as we are, which is the chordates. So when they settle down onto the seabed, they lose that notochord. But for whatever reason, they are um, cl more closely related to us than things like crabs and lobsters. Another tiny little thing to look out for um, are stalked jellyfish. Now you have to have really good eyes for these because these really are like a centimetre big and they grow on seaweed. There's lots of different types of species, but again, absolutely fascinating animals. They're not true jellyfish. They, they sort of spend um, most of their life stuck to the seaweed like this. And as you can see, they look quite different to uh, a true jelly, which has these tentacles hanging down. But again, beautiful little animals that we can find attached to seaweed. Now, an awesome sea slug is solar powered sea slug. Um, and do have a Google of these because I've just got a picture here of it um, curled up. But when it's under the water and when it's sort of nice and relaxed, it unfurls its body and it looks like a leaf. It's absolutely amazing. And you can just make out on the picture here these turquoise spots that it has all over its body. And those are actually chloroplasts. So this was another public vote for the, for the common name, solar powered. And that's because it can actually photosynthesize and get the products of that photosynthesis. So, so basically, it's got algae inside its body that produces food for it to eat, which is just absolutely amazing for an animal to do. And we know that corals can do that. Some anemones can do that. But, you know, sea slugs, that's something, you know, amazing and um, quite new, newish to science. OK, so that was my whistle stop tour of the creatures and amazing seaweeds that we get. I can't do a talk about rock pooling without promoting the seashore code. It's really important that um, you can imagine how busy our beaches are in the summer here in Devon. It's really important that we set a really good example and we look after the wildlife and ourselves when we're rock pooling. So one of the hardest messages to get across, something we've been advocating at Wembury for like the last 30 years, uh, but still the messages struggle to get out there is is that we don't need nets to go rock pooling. We can use our hands, we can use tubs, we can pick things up really nicely and carefully. Nets can damage creatures, damage the habitat. They're, they're plastic, they end up on the beaches, they only cost about two or three pounds. Um, so we just need to say no to nets. Okay, so one creature in our tub at a time with some water. Um, if we put big crabs in there, a predator and a prey, um, we, you know, we don't want to, to cause them any undue stress. It's stressful enough being picked up um, by a human. So, you know, even if, you, if you're taking children rock pooling, obviously they want to pick things up and have a look at them. And sometimes you need to do that to identify them. But again, just watching the animals in their, in their homes and in their habitats is really nice. We don't have to pick them up. Um, and often when it comes to crabs anyway, we not, you know, not everyone wants to pick them up. So, one at a time is a really good rule and that's a, a really tricky thing when it comes to crabbing because crabbing is always promoted you know let's get as many crabs as we can in our tub um but one at a time is our message really important to put everything back exactly where we found it so lots of the male fish the dads will guard the eggs until they hatch out um lots of animals brood young pipe fish for example might mate for life so it's really important don't cause any changes to those habitats um, and it's all about minimal disturbance. So putting the rocks back up the right way and just being careful where we're walking, obviously. The limpets and the barnacles are pretty hardy, but we just want to make sure we're not crushing loads of sea snails whilst we're going, just taking care. Um, obviously being safe, being kind, looking after the place, taking our rubbish with us and uh, picking up some extra litter if we can. OK, so if you want to get involved, how can you help? Devon's Marine Wildlife, always follow the seashore code. Um, we've been campaigning for marine conservation zones. Our latest campaign is about highly protected marine areas. Some are going to be designated, but none in the southwest were uh, were picked. So we're, we're going to keep trying to try and get some of these areas in Devon and Cornwall. And these would be properly protected marine areas where 
any damaging activity would be prohibited. Um, but we need public support and we need people to, to spread the message about that. Taking guardianship of your local beach. We talked at the beginning about, you know, the huge number of visitors that come here in the summer. Um, we need to be the ones to set those good examples as to, you know, this is how we look after our beach. Here at Wembury, we've got a proper voluntary code of conduct where we ask people to leave nothing, take nothing. It's really difficult to get that across to certain certain groups, certain sports and activities which do remove things. Um, but, you know, the more people that, that spread that message of just caring for these really, really important places, um, because this is our marine natural heritage that we're talking about. So we need to look after them. Kate mentioned citizen science at the beginning. We run uh, Shore Search, which is a rocky shore intertidal monitoring project. So we're doing shore search down here at Wembury. Um, we've got the amazing Coastwise group in North Devon and then uh, Shores of South Devon as well, who are based around sort of Torquay area. So do come and join us on a shore search survey um, or join us as a member or volunteer. OK, thank you very much. Um, love to take some questions if we've got time, because that's my favourite bit. I do have a few. Firstly, just to let people know, I shared in the chat Devon Wildlife Trust's link, which has got some of their free guides on. So you can print those out and take them to the beach. The first question was, um, or someone asked if there was going to be um, an image or something on seahorses. Um, and I'm assuming you didn't put them in because I've never seen them rock pulling. But I have seen at Wembury the uh, pipe, pipe fish. fish. But yes. Have you ever seen them? Seahorses no, in so seahorses um, are incredibly rare now, unfortunately. They used to be very common in Devon, um, but their preferred habitat is seagrass. So we don't really get them on rocky shores. You get them in, in seagrass meadows. So they would have been um, in places like Tor Bay, um, at the mouths of our estuaries where we get seagrass, like the Yelm estuary. Um, so we wouldn't find them rock pooling generally unless one got, got a bit lost. Um, but as Kate said, we do find their cousins, the worm pipe fish. And then d in deeper waters, you get the greater pipe fish and the snake pipe fish. So, um, yeah, really amazing animals. But yeah, seahorses are incredibly hard to find. And you also technically need a license to even look for them because they're critically endangered. The next one is around favourite places in Devon and it also links to a question about Lundy. So um, Lundy is absolutely brilliant for rock pulling. It is a marine protected area but you are allowed to rock pull. However you do, as Coral said, need to follow um, the seashore code and be very careful with what you put back. I've also shared a link to North Devon Beaches which is on the Coastwise website um, and if you are in North Devon, um, Lee Bay near Ilfracombe is fantastic. Um, Woolacombe, if you go out where the pipe goes, that's where you'll find lots of starfish. And Martin. Coomartin. Um, Westwood Ho is very good. I used to take kids there. That was a really good place. On the south coast, I was really surprised that you can find in Sidmouth honeycomb reef worms. And you can find quite a lot in Sidmouth. Um, but is there any other favourite places, Coral, you would suggest apart from Wembury? Yeah, I mean, we are, we're sport for choice, I think. Um, so Corbin Head, like where, where short, so if you um, look up shores of South Devon as well, they go to places around Torquay, um, Sheldon, Corbin Head has got some great rock pools. Um, Goodrington was always good for rock pooling and what's amazing is that even in Devon we've got such variety so like Kate said on the towards the east um, sandier shores where you've got the honeycomb worm reefs you know that's that's incredible they're a biodiversity action plan um, habitat and it's really important that we don't trample on those because they can be really uh, easily damaged by trampling so you have to be careful where you're walking and we get those on the north coast as well but um, I would just say explore as much as you can because there's different things to find in each place. Oh, I've got another question. Um, been rock pooling recently, but most seem to be empty. Even the deep ones used to find at least the common prawns. Have you noticed less since you were younger? So have you noticed the decline in the amount of uh, things you're finding in the rock pools? Um, that's a really, really good question. And um it's really difficult to 
to answer without you know you need to look at research and evidence so anecdotally we've definitely noticed changes here at Wembury um, we're, I mean, we're spoilt for choice in that Wembury is such a diverse place. It's hard to say um, if we're if we're finding less, but we're certainly finding different species and different numbers of species. So we've got way more invasive seaweed than we used to have. Lots more invasive animals, things like sea squirts, bryozoans. Um, there's lots more of those. Lots more of the warmer water species. So the cushion star is a warmer water species. So as our water's already getting warmer, we're finding more of those. And I mentioned earlier about the furrowed crab. Um, do do look those up if you're if you're interested. Those have become really common now and almost the most dominant species here. And I know that's travelling east towards Dorset as well because they're finding a lot more of them. So I think it's it's hard to, it's hard for me to say because we don't you don't currently have a you know an assessment of all of the rocky shores across Devon. There is the state of uh, state of Devon seas, I think, Kate, which um, DCC have commissioned, which is a good good indicator. Um, but I think we we all know what the pressures are on our marine environment. That it's huge amounts of pressures. Um, so we all have to sort of do our bit and, and raise awareness and, and, you know, encourage everyone to look after them and, and do their bit to reduce those pressures. And that could be any, things from climate change, overfishing, um, plastics and water pollution. Have you had um, this winter, did you notice anything with avian flu as well, um, with the amount of bird species that were, were you having seabirds washed up or? Yeah, so it was more, it was actually almost this time last year wasn't it I think it was more towards the end of summer um we did have some gannet quite a few gannets washed up um guillemots I imagine around Berryhead it would have been a lot worse I think uh, in Cornwall they had um a lot of dead seabirds as well so it's it's been it's been quite you know tricky and quite sad um but further north in the UK and up in Scotland I know it's been absolutely devastating where whole populations um, have been wiped out. I think we probably got away a bit lightly down here, but um, yeah, it was still still really sad to see when, when these things come along and um, just hope that action will be taken in future to avoid things like that. But it's, it's very difficult with wild birds and um, diseases. And, uh, you know, as we've seen in humans as well, it's tricky, so. And then I have one last question for you, which is is from me. Um, from Wembry, um, how often do you see different cetaceans coming in and around the area? Because th- am I right? You've got some sound recording off Wembry for cetaceans. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, first question is: there are lots of cetaceans out there. So in Devon's waters, you could you know, in, in one sort of season, you could easily, if, if you were a pro, you could spot, you know, up to 10 different species of cetaceans. And by cetaceans, we mean whales, dolphins, porpoises. Um, from Wembury, we don't see a huge amount because they obviously prefer slightly deeper water. We have seen amazing common dolphins just off the Mewstone before. Um, we've had whales out by the Eddystone Inn, so that's about six miles offshore. Um, so we do have, as part of a network along um, Cornwall and South Devon, uh, what's called an F-Pod, which is an acoustic monitoring device, basically like a big microphone that goes under the water, um, and it can detect uh, dolphin species as well as porpoises. Um, and that's already shown that uh, dolphins and porpoises are very common, so it can't distinguish between different dolphin species yet. Um, but common dolphins uh, are probably the most common, if that makes sense, although they're more of an offshore species and porpoises as well. But uh, down in Cornwall, I think at the weekend, a bowhead whale was spotted, which is absolutely incredible. Oh, wow. Um, basking sharks should be along. Basking shark sightings definitely seem to be co- becoming less common. Um, but, you know, it should be another good season for, for cetaceans. And there's lots of groups. Berryhead is a really good place for sea watching if you, if you haven't already been there. More point on the north coast. Um, and then, of course, we've got our amazing seals. And there's the seal project in uh, Brixham who monitor the seals there. And, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, Devon's amazing for rocky shore life and marine megafauna. So we're very, very lucky and very spoiled, I think.
Great. Thank you so much, Coral. And hopefully this has given everyone a bit of a flavour of what you can go and find or um, if you already were quite aware what was going on, just a bit of a refresher to get you all out. Um, so as a few people have asked in the chat, we will be putting this up. It takes about a week for us to, uh, we have to write up all the captions ourselves to go with it. So it'll take about a week for us to get this on to our YouTube. Um, but as soon as that's done, we do email you from um, your joining email today with the link. And I will put in that email some um, links to the beach profiles in North Devon and then to the Wembury uh, Devon Wildlife Trust page, which does have these PDFs on there of species you can spot. I think, am I right? Um, Devon Wildlife Trust has YouTube page as well yes, with some we do, yeah. things yeah so I'll include that as well so you can go out and spot um but otherwise I, Coral are you running rock pulling all through the summer with your beach rangers yes thank you Kate I was just going to say um we have got a nighttime rock pool safari actually this Thursday so we're only doing three of those this year and uh, so if anyone's interested in what these animals get up to after dark absolutely fascinating do come and join us but we've got rock pool safaris going on at weekends through the summer holidays until the end of september shore search surveys go all year and our snorkel safaris are starting tomorrow as well so um do check everything out on our website devonwildlifetrust.org um, and hopefully see see some of you this summer and I would totally recommend the snorkeling ones because sometimes you go and you can't spot anything and you need somebody's eye in to be like, oh, that's, uh, I don't know, sometimes you find dogfish and I can never see them. But if you're with someone who knows what they're looking for, they'll be able to point them out. So if you want to go for a snorkel safari, I definitely recommend going at Wembury. Um, so if we're going to end the video now. Um, but Coral and Bella and 